Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Grey Matter and Source Control webinar, an introduction for investors. My name is Ben Gilbert. I'm with Grey Matter, and I'm a senior account manager here. I've been here for around eight years now. Um, and I'll shortly be passing you over to Paul McAdam from Source Code Control. Grey Matter have been an independent software supplier since 1983. Uh, and we started with a focus towards application development um, and tools, um, which still remains today. That's uh, our, our main speciality, if you like. Um, although our biggest publisher is Microsoft, we've got about another 300 publishers that we deal directly with. And we're able to source software from about another thousand or, or, or more even publishers. We specialize in licensing advice and services to ensure our customers have the right software at the right price and are correctly, li correctly licensed and it's sufficiently implemented. So open source software is gaining popularity in the corporate environment as a, and as a tool for developers. Um, let's face it, it's free, so why not? Um, you can customize it to suit your own requirements. And many sets of eyes means that security problems can be spotted quickly and you've got an army of developers there ready and waiting to uh, to fix them and sort them out. Um, anyone can fix bugs so you're not reliant on a vendor, vendor or publisher um, and you're less likely possibly to be orphaned with a, uh, with a product that isn't profitable um, as it uh, uh, continues with the masses if you like. What we do sense from our customer base is uh, a little confusion. Um, some some companies, the, you know, so the managers may not be aware that they've actually made use of open source code uh, or the risks inherent in, in doing so. Um, that might be through outsourcing or uh, not, you know, sort of necessarily being aware of how developers are working within the organization or even the elements are included within Visual Studio or other IDEs and GitHub and the likes. So the idea of the webinar is not to frighten anyone about the pitfalls and the massive dangers, but just to ensure that everyone's using best practice and setting policies to get the best out of open source software. So with no further ado now, uh, I'll pass you over to Paul and um, he's gonna tell you, tell you more. Brilliant, thanks Ben. My name's uh, Paul McAdam, I'm Director of Source Code Control. Uh, and we're a small but beautifully formed um, set of specialists working on helping organizations with the the risk in their open source environment. Now I say that it's actually a, the development environment, um, irrespective of whether you're intending, you're setting out to create something which is open source or actually just creating software for your customers. The latest surveys indicate that 95 to 96% of software which is published on the market includes some open source components within that um, with that within the product. We advertise this uh, this presentation as being for investors and for developers. Quite often, the the goal of a, a software company is to obviously build themselves up to a reasonable size. At which point, they can either apply for uh, funding, or they can they can go another round for funding, or alternatively to be uh, to be purchased by somebody else. And what I would like to do is to uh, um, just to let you sit back and relax. And I'll tell you a story about um, an organization who came to us um, just over the May bank holiday. It is, as it says on the screen there, one slightly used software company. And what we found was lots of security issues, a lack of copyright and incorrect licensing. And you can imagine if that was an advert for uh, for the software company, you probably wouldn't uh, rush in to buy that software organization. But if I tell you how the how this uh, rolled out over the weekend, I think it makes for an interesting tale and probably something to which everybody uh, can relate. So the, the the setup for this story is there's two organizations. There's company A. Company is a about a 200 employee organization. They work in retail planning. They've got um, uh, sort of European focus. They're a UK company with European focus, um, and they've got le leading industry customers, so brand names that you would recognise. And Company B was the acquisition target. They had filled in one of these um, uh, forms, if you like, with a uh, uh, with an agent who was looking to to find a, a suitable buyer. As part of that form, 
it said, you know, how do you license your product? And they said, oh, well, you know, we have an end user license agreement. And, and it said, do you use open source? And they said, no. And it, he said, do, do you have any uh, GPL? Um, and they, they said, no, we don't have any um, of, of the, the, the general license in there. So, um, but they, they filled that out to the best of their understanding based on what they knew. So um, they they fitted they fit sorry quite nicely with uh, with company A um, because their software package was for for retail property maintenance and they also had a small footprint in the US as well and that was very attractive to company A. So we've got company A the acquirer and company B the the acquisition. Now we as a company we've been talking to company A for some time um, suggesting that they should try come on one of our training courses or or maybe try our software services and they came to us on the, the Thursday saying we, we're just a little bit concerned about about this we're but we're considering making this acquisition and we'd like you to take a look at their software and what they sent us in the first instance was an Excel spreadsheet of the file structure we had a little bit of a look at that and said, well, there's not a lot we can tell from there. It looks like there might be some open source. But you, you, what was very clear was that the application was a .NET SQL application. So there was absolutely no intention from company B for them to be writing uh, open source uh, software or using open source software. Um, so there was nothing explicit we could tell. We got our hands on the uh, on an ISO of the 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 demo system and obviously that gave us access to the file so we were able to use our our skills obviously and uh, and the technology at our disposal um to do a thing called software composition analysis where we we look at what's inside the software and we were actually yes and um, before anyone asked the question we were scanning the binaries at that point it is possible with the technology um, the solution um, is available in a couple of different forms. It was available as software as a service, a hosted um, capability. It's available as a, uh, as a server to install within maybe your headquarters. Standalone as well. And, you know, if you were setting up a new uh, super, um, sorry, retail uh, outlet or um, perhaps a shopping mall, something like that, then you would want to use the software standalone until you were networked. Um, and the interfaces were both tablet and uh, phone. So we've got um, a, a not intentional open source software um, with lots of different ways of accessing the system. Now, what we found uh, doing running our analysis was uh, we scanned in the region of five and a half thousand files um, and estimated 135,000 lines of code. And what we found with 26 different components within open source components within uh, the software. And you can see immediately if you when you look at the donut on the left hand side that there's some concern about four of the items within there. We'll, we'll come back to that. In terms of security vulnerability, these two tend to be the two things which get flagged up. Firstly, license. Secondly, security. Just to also mention that there are operational issues as well. If, for example, you're doing uh, if a piece of development becomes an orphan, the technology that we use will identify that for you um, as well. But we did find 15 security vulnerabilities of note, um, and six of those were high, in other words, exploitable vulnerabilities which had been registered with the National Vulnerability Database, which is the, the database that, that, that a lot of these systems or all these systems tend to, to, tend to hang off. This is what we created for the customer. It's called um, it's called the Bill of Materials, and I'll explain this in a little bit more detail later. Um, but we we identified obviously a set of components in the first column. You can see there we've got a lot of uh, use of Zlib or Zlib as the American call, Americans call it. We've got uh, jQuery, etc. You can see the name of the component in the second column. The third component is uh, is the license which has been used. And you can see that part way down we've got the 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 GNU, we've got four uh, GPL uh, licenses in there of the, the version two flavor. And that, that's going to cause us some concern um, as we went on to advise company as to what happened with company B. In the fourth column, you can see the security vulnerabilities. And a lot of those security vulnerabilities were relating to the, the, the Zlib component. Now, the thing to remember is this isn't an open source application. So even though um, the company had filled in the form saying, yeah, we don't use open source for a .NET um, development house, 
this, this, in my experience, is not untypical. Modern application development has moved on from sitting down and writing your own code. Why would you want to uh, write a net filter? Why would you want to write a calendar control or a photo manager or something like that? When those components are already available within the open source library, and as Ben says, you've got plenty of eyes on it, plenty of people testing, and you've got access to, to bigger chunks to accelerate your development. However, like all software, you do need to uh, manage the software in terms of in terms of its security. So, uh, what we found what then was there was a um, a series of issues, just a general mismanagement. And like I say, like any other um, software, uh, open source licensing requires management. And here's some uh, here's a list of some of the good practice that you should be looking to adhere to. First of all, you should be making sure that you fully copyright your software with your company's name in the correct format. And I've got an example of the correct format there. So copyright, you, you, the little C symbol is actually, uh, you don't need to have the word copyright and the little C symbol, um, the year, uh, and then to whom it's copyrighted. Now, if somebody else has copyrighted a piece of a component or a piece of code, then you shouldn't interfere with that. You should write what's called a modification notice, which is down at the bottom of the screen. So you can leave the copyright for the original piece of work and just say, I've made some modifications to this, the copyright um, copyright for the modifications and some a little description as to what's changed. Now, a license notice is a notice which identifies the license which is in use. And I've got an example there on the, the right hand side. We've identified that this one's being used under the MIT license. It's actually two and a half thousand different open source licenses. But thankfully, there's only about 20 to 30 of them are commonly used. Um, and the MIT license being one of the most common ones. So you'll, you'll see that one pop up time and time again. Now, you are actually required as part of um, open source development to pull together a list of the licenses for each of the components that you've used. If you're a Google Chrome, br um, Chrome browser uh, user, then if you go to the about statement, you can see in there a full list of all the different licenses that they've incorporated into their, their browser. Google actually do this incredibly well. And finally, yeah, you need an attribution notice, um, which basically acknowledges the identity of the original author. Um, and, and that can, can appear within the code itself. It can appear uh, alongside the license notice. That's quite common where you, you sort of say, it's this component, this is who wrote it, uh, this is the license it's been released under, and then click here to be able to see the details of that license. Now, I mentioned that we found four GPL licenses, and that causes us a little bit of concern. Company B had made their uh, software available under a, an end user license agreement, a, a sort of custom license, if you like, for, for their own technology. And that was the basis on which they'd sold out, sold to their customers. Now, GPL licenses, um, are, are kind of intrinsically linked to the software component that's in use, and they have two requirements. The first one is reciprocity. If you use a single GPL component, then your software, when you distribute it, is considered to be um, you know, modification or an addition or addendum to that software, and therefore you have to license your software under GPL uh, as well. Now, obviously, in that case, if you're creating an end user license agreement, then that's not what you're doing. So you've effectively broken the terms and conditions uh, of that GPL license. The second thing under GPL is you have to make the source code uh, available. You have to make an offer for the source code, and that has to be the exact version. You can't just give you know, a, a test version. It has to be the exact version that the, the user is, is, um, is using. That offer has to be public. Uh, and it has to be uh, visible. And you can see that I've highlighted for you on the right-hand side in yellow, I've identified the two components where recipro reciprocity applies and where the existence uh, of that written offer has to be made. And again, in the case of company B, this wasn't being adhered to, unfortunately. Now, we I mentioned that we'd identified 15 security vulnerabilities. There's a list there. 
uh, of those, quite a few high ones, unfortunately. Um, high means uh, that they are exploitable. In other words, they're hackable. Um, and I think for me, probably the most impactful thing was that the issues, some of the issues dated back to 2002. Now, again, in my experience, this is not uncommon. What happens is that development teams have a lot of pressure on them and they develop forward. They move forward in time. Then people are not being paid to go back and patch and to check and to identify what components have been used in the past. It also sort of indicates a little bit of untidy development because you've got multiple versions of the same component kicking around your code. That could mean um, different ways of, of, of calling or making, um, making access to that piece of code. And, and that could be tidied up. It's not bad practice, it's just it could be tidied up. Um, but clearly there was no ownership by management in this case. There was no patching strategy. There was nobody uh, making sure that these uh, vulnerabilities, and, and in this case, exploitable vulnerabilities, were being resolved on behalf of the customers. Now, if you think, I always refer to software industry as being like a supply chain. Effectively, in this case, what the organization was doing was um, passing on a hackable vulnerability um, to, to their customers. Now, obviously, if you're company B, you're looking at, sorry, company A, you're looking at this new information that you've got about company B and you've got very much uh, cause for concern. Albeit, you can perhaps look at it as a little bit of an opportunity. If we, we were to assume that the original offer for company B was in the region of a million pounds, have a think in your head, I don't have an answer for you, but have a think in your head how much you would pay for that organization now. Um, and I've got a pretty good bet that says that none of you are thinking any number higher than a million pounds. It's certainly uh, a case of re reduction of company value. So the outcome of this was obviously we went back with our report, and this is just one of many reports that we, of this type that we've done over the, the last few years. Um, we um, reported back to company A exactly what we'd found in the works of company B. They asked um, company B to respond to above and, and, and suggest ways in which they could rectify um, those issues. Now, the, the slight problem with that is that for company B, um, uh, as I've already indicated, they've lost a little, they've lost some company value uh, of, of a size that we can't determine. Um, they've, they've incorrectly signed a disclosure, which had been made available to other organizations and, and potentially could be legal action there. They've significantly lost their negotiating position and they also charge for upgrades. So the costs that they were now looking at were basically time to remediate those issues, time out to customers uh, in terms of getting them to upgrade and to, to change those issues, and then a loss of uh, an opportunity cost in terms of not being able to sell them the new version. In theory, they are actually open to legal action to extract the code that has been uh, achieved in the US. As far as I'm aware, it hasn't happened in the UK. Um, but there is a, a there would be a legal option there to say, well, the code, the, the license that you have in use requires you to release the code. Therefore, we want you to, re to release the code. The outcome for us was um, obviously company A um, we're, we're having considerations about whether they wanted to invest, whether they wanted to take on those problems, and we're obviously looking to pay much less than the original offer. And interestingly, company A as well, they came back to us and they said, well, thanks very much, guys, for the report. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I'm sure you're busy this week, but can we get you in next week to come and review our code because we don't want anyone coming back and telling us that they've got the same value. So that supply chain concept is very much uh, an issue and very telling in this particular example. So how does, the, how does this happen in the real world? Well, um, the open source community is out there building wonderful, pulling together wonderful ideas, wonderful um, concepts for people to use. And if you again, if you think about what you provide to your customers as being a supply chain, your developers are probably under incredible amount of pressure to get code out the door. And 
and as I said right at the start, why you would you want to start writing a clock or um, a web filter or so, something like that? You use, you patch and bring these components together. There was a recent survey that actually identified one piece of software in particular, which was 98% components and just 2% of the code within it was, was the, the unique sauce stitching those components together. But as I mentioned, this is, you know, I don't want anyone to go away thinking, but well, you know what, we don't use open source. As the example has identified, this is just as relevant for .NET development as it is for any other type of development. This is the way that developers are uh, and your developers are operating. Probably the, what I've tried to highlight in the middle there is the, the sort of the high risk scenarios where you've got reused code, for example, uh, third party code where you're, you've maybe brought in another company, for example, or brought in a set of contractors. Your legacy code, you can see from the example that I identified, the legacy code had issues back to 2002. And actually the analysis, just understand what components are in there is really important. And outsource code is quite possibly the highest uh, risk item where, where you write a specification, you pass that potentially to another country and they come back with, with something that looks and feels correct. You can even pen test it. Yep, it does exactly what it's supposed to do. But I, I've always, I've said on a regular basis, it's a little bit like homebrew. The thing with homebrew is it tastes like beer. It does the same thing as beer and it'll get you drunk, but you've got absolutely no idea what's in the bottle because there's no label on it. And unfortunately, that's a way that a lot of the IT, uh, the software industry um, is being developed. So there's your little components from lots of different sources um, firing across into your delivered code. And then obviously the thing to just underline is that there is an ongoing activity to stay on top of that delivered code because a component that you incorporate into your, your delivered solution today could experience a new vulnerability tomorrow. There's 100,000 vulnerabilities uh, which are in the National Vulnerability Database uh, and they're being added to at the rate of about 10 uh, or sorry, in excess of 10 new vulnerabilities for open source components every single day. So I think I've, I've probably covered this in, in quite a lot of detail, but uh, I mean, I, I just wanted to, to flag with a, a, a little example. This is, this is one of the things I'm passionate about in life. I love a good sandwich and a nice little um, application put together there with four or five different components on it. And that the beauty of that bill of materials which we created is it allows you to immediately identify the problems. I can see just from that very simple example, I've got licensing risks, a number of licensing risks, because I've got Apache, for example. Um, but because I've got G and I've got an intention to publish my code under Apache as well, because it looks like a nice license. But um, there's a conflict there with the GPL license because of the the requirement for reciprocity that I identified earlier. I've got a, a Creative Commons license, CC by NC. Now that NC means not for commercial use. Now, if I was wanting to commercially, if I was wanting to sell some advertising space, I wouldn't be able to use that license. The not for commercial use would prevent me from doing that. And we've got a WTFPL license. So I'll leave you to Google what that license actually stands for. Um, but the interesting thing about that, it's kind of an anti-license trying to say, look, just push this out into the public domain. You do what you want with it. But the problem with that, it doesn't contain any disclaimers or limitations of warranty um, for, uh, for the application or for the use of that component. So if you were to use or adopt that license, then you could be opening yourself up to um, legal problems further down the line if something went wrong with the software. In terms that we also identify operational risks, as I mentioned earlier, so we can see Photoit, for example, was last updated in 2010. It could be a perfectly beautiful solution, but eight years without any updates is a long time. Is that really what I want to do? What happens if something goes wrong with that piece of software? Can I um, rely on the fact that there's development uh, on, ongoing there? Um, and then finally, security risks. Well, one of the things that you, you can't see, I can't quite find a way to, to demonstrate this to you, but there's four versions of Crossref available now, and I'm on version one, exactly as we saw in the example earlier um, with company B using Zlib.
So that bill of material helps us to navigate the components that were, are within our solution and manage them. It's kind of like software asset management, except for the development uh, world in the modern de um, application development environment. Now, one organization, um, I'm nearly at the end of the presentation. Now, one of the, the uh, one organization who's doing this incredibly well is uh, the NHS England. And NHS England has a, there's an organization affiliated with it called Aperta. And Aperta have published open standards for, for healthcare, so nothing to do with the technology. Um, but they've identified uh, the way in which healthcare should be managed through a series of open standards. And one, there's a, a project called Code for Health. And Code for Health is taking those open standards and uh, trying to um, fill in solutions using those open standards, the, the champions of those open standards. And so there's an ecosystem or a community of people who are writing for Code for Health. Uh, they can be small application development companies, be quite big application development companies, or they can be NHS trusts. And one of the things that the NHS is trying to do is to, to move away from the monolithic proprietary systems, which are tied into um, specific and, and very custom license agreements and very large uh, uh, ongoing support agreements and, and to encourage innovation around these smaller development um, companies and, and parts of the NHS and uh, encourage that innovation, but then to be able to bring it back into the middle and allow everybody else around the NHS to be able to, to, um, to develop uh, using the open standards and using open uh, technology. Now, the service that we provide for the NHS is that we help each of these organizations, um, these sort of on, on uh, target or on message organizations, we help them um, to look at their software, to ensure that there, there are no issues there, to ensure they're co correctly copyrighted, they're correctly licensed, to help them identify any security vulnerabilities and to help them stay on top of those security vulnerabilities over time. We provide regular reports identifying new vulnerabilities as they appear. And that actually happened just a few weeks ago. One of the solutions um, identified uh, and there was a new vulnerability within a component within the solution and we help them to fix that with a very sharp turn turnaround. And if you think about obviously the difficulties that that particular organization has had with WannaCry, so not only are we helping innovation, but we're helping to reduce the, the overall risk of application development within the, NA, within the NHS as well. And the specification that we follow is the, the little icon that's down beside our brand name there. It's a thing called OpenChain. Um, it's uh, backed by the Linux Foundation. There's only two companies in the UK who are allowed to uh, accredit people with OpenChain. We're one of them. Um, and uh, if you're at all interested in think how you think about this um, software as a supply chain, that's a great place to start. It's not an international standard like an ISO 1000, 2000, whatever, um, but it is a specification, as I say, it's backed by the Linux Foundation. And it's a great way of getting your head around the principles, how you take that on board. The long-term um, vision for the NHS is that it will require all of these companies contributing to the NHS to adhere to the open chain uh, standard to ensure that they've been through the correct steps, um, to ensure that they are correctly managing their open source components. So it's working very well for the NHS. So what's next uh, for you? Well, first of all, I want to say um, Thank you very much for, for your attention, listening to my story. Um, we have a number of offerings which are available with, through our partner, um, Grey Matter. We have a, a training course which uh, will go through this in a little bit more, quite a lot more detail, we'll go through the, the legal aspects of it. We, we go through ways in which you can get that wrong, what the impacts can be, and then how to get that right and, and how to uh, develop your software. We also talk a lot about how you can turn this into a competitive advantage. If I was uh, if I was a decision maker and I'm sitting looking at two organisations or two solutions, and one of them is is telling me all the steps they've taken to be correctly uh, correct and compliant and correctly copyrighted and correctly licensed, and another one who's saying just trust me, my homebrew is brilliant, I would certainly be going for the former organisation. We, we also provide um, uh, different 
styles of checks of your software. So if you were thinking, yep, Paul, thanks very much, I get it, but I'd just like to see the size of my problem. Again, through Gray Master, we can um, we can arrange for uh, a design check or a cybersecurity check to be to be done. We will create a bill of materials for you on a single project, and then we can walk through that. You can you can kind of learn as you move forward, or alternatively, reach out to us. You know, we're always quite happy um, you know to, to to discuss how we can help you in different scenarios. Probably the probably the easiest and simplest first step though is to attend the training and the link is there on the bottom of the screen for you. The key thing, the key message I want to leave you with, know your security vulnerabilities, make sure you understand the licenses that you're using, make sure your code's copyrighted, and obviously don't pass risks on down the supply chain. So I think that's it from me. We have we have a bit of time, so I um, don't know if, we've, if we have any, any questions that pops up. Just checking the interface there. We've no, we've no written questions. I'd like to um, uh, thank everyone for coming this afternoon. Um, if you do have questions and you'd like to um, take them, you know, sort of um, uh, individually or uh, talk further to Paul and myself about um, uh, any sort of uh, unique or, or individual um, questions that might come up, then please uh, please get in touch with us. Um, uh, the telephone number on the uh, on the screen there, um, and um, uh, and emails at Grey Matter or reach out to your account manager, um, and um, we'll set something up for you. Um, so uh, uh, in the meantime, um, uh, Paul, have you anything else to uh, to add? No, nope. all good, Ben. Thanks very much. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and uh, you know, best of luck in business, and don't hesitate to get in contact. Brilliant. Okay, and thank you very much from Grey Matter, and um, speak to you soon. Many thanks.